I don't think I'd want to have a theological debate with him. <laughs> Even if you're right, you would, he would exhaust you out. <laughs> well, let's go to the book of Romans. Chapter 6, we'll finish up chapter 6, we'll go on the day. If you recall from the previous lesson, we hit on, once again, being free from sin. Paul kind of keeps talking about this relationship we have with sin and righteousness, and how we are either a servant of sin or a servant of righteousness, but how in Christ we are free from sin. Amen. We'll pick up here in verse 21. We talk about the first part of that, so I won't be a dead horse, so to speak, but we'll begin in verse 21 here. He says, What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have fruit unto holiness and the end of excuse me, and the end of everlasting life. Amen. The wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life for Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Again, verse 21 begins with how we had this corrupt fruit before we were saved. That was the only fruit we had. He describes how we should be ashamed of those things which we used to live in. I'm afraid many professing Christians, though, aren't ashamed of sin anymore. Rather, they just make excuses for it. Right. But notice what he says about those things in the last part of that verse. For the end of those things is death. Sin always results in death. But those things which we used to live in, that, those sins which we used to control us, they result in death always. Amen. We know physical death is the result of sin. That is why death and suffering all around us. The whole of creation is under the curse of sin. That is why the animals die and everything else decays. But spiritually, we also were dead because of sin. When Adam, we all died. Amen. Even now in our new life, in a sense, we have death because of sin. We, and the fact that it separates our fellowship from God. When we have open and abject sin in our lives, we can't be walking in fellowship with Him. In that sense, it separates us from God. And ultimately, sin will result in eternal death for those who are not in Christ. Amen. And all who are not written in the Lamb's book of life shall be cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. That's what Revelation 20 tells us. Amen. For that death has no end, which is the, at least for the flesh, is a scary thought. Mm -hmm. Many today try to dismiss the afterlife, we'll call it, because they... It's much more comfortable to think that death is just the end of it. Mm -hmm. But when you realize that there is eternity for all of us, it becomes a bit more of a, a wake-up call, if you will. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, and as well as chapter 16, verse 25, they both tell us there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but in there are the ways of death. Right. So there are many today that are doing what they think is right or doing what they think is going to earn them favor with God. And they're guided by their own individual morality and standards of right and wrong. And yet without God, all those things will end up in death. As the proverb that writer there said, but in there of is death. There's a way which seems right unto a man, but in there of is death. That's Man who goes after his own way of doing right, he's not going to end up with eternal life. Amen. A man who seeks to do that which is right in his own eyes, he's not going to end in eternal life. So, without getting ahead of myself, though, we will look in verse 23 about what is eternal life. 
So be, you can mark it down that the ways of man don't end in eternal life. Right. Doing what we think is right, doing what feels good, doing what society says is okay. None of those things lead us to eternal life. I'm afraid, even among professing Christians, that we have a very light view of sin today. Amen. And then we wonder why God isn't blessing and isn't moving among us like he used to do. Mm -hmm. I said sin, even in our lives, separates us from the fellowship of God. We often quoted Isaiah where he says, The Lord's hand is not heavy that he cannot save you, his ear that he cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. The problem is never with God, it's always with us. Yeah. That we have a relaxed view of holiness, as we'll get to in a moment, and yet, then we expect God to just be pleased with us. Right. And going on to verse 22, he says, But now, some of us have, but now, that is, there is a change for us that are saved. We are no longer in bondage to sin. We're no longer bearing that corrupt fruit which leads to death. He says, but now being made free from sin. <coughs> again and again and again, he keeps hitting that point that we are, if we're in Christ, we are free from sin. Amen. You know, sin still reigns in your life. You might want to examine your soul's condition. I'm not talking about the struggle that we face with sin. I think we'll see that very plainly in chapter 7. That any believer who's trying to serve God, he's going to struggle with good versus evil in his own life. But for those who profess the name of Christ and yet just live in sin as if nothing's ever happened to them, I don't know that they've ever been freed from sin in Christ. Right. Amen. And it was, here it says they were made free from sin, being made free from sin. And we did not free ourselves, but God through Christ did. We did not work our way out of bondage and sin, but the Son has made us free, and the Son has made us free, we are free indeed, Christ says. Mm -hmm. And notice what he says after that. Now being made, being made free from sin and become servants to God. This is really the result of being made free from sin, that we are the servant of God. I don't think we sometimes understand the idea of slavery or servitude and freedom like like those in here in Romans would have but you know, we have what we call freedom in America even though I don't know that we really have what we think we have anymore right but we don't really value the idea of being free not a servant anymore of sin right And the same on the other side of that, we don't really fully understand what it means that we are to be the servants of God. Yes, we have liberty in Christ, but we're not to use that liberty for our own good, are we? Amen. He says, "Only use not that liberty for an occasion to the flesh." Over in Galatians. Mm -hmm. We are free in Christ, but we're not to use that freedom to do whatever we want to. In fact. Really, we owe our life to the one who gave his life for us. Amen. We owe our service to the one who gave us this freedom. Because he has made us free from sin, then we are really, in a sense, in bondage to serve God. Mm -hmm. Now, to the flesh, that doesn't sound appeasing. To a nominal Christian, that doesn't sound very appeasing or appealing to them, does it? <laughs> you don't want... Man, by nature, doesn't like to be in bondage to anyone. Right. Yet, as Paul has pointed very clearly, we are either the servants of God or we are the servants of sin. We are the servants of righteousness or we are the servants of unrighteousness. There is really no other options. We must, if we profess to be saved, we must serve God. Mm-hmm. Really, anyone who has truly been born again you know, of the grace of God, I'm not sure how they could not have a desire to serve God. 
I don't know, we're, we're prone to fall, we're prone to fail, we're prone to mess up, we're prone to get into sin. We're prone to do a lot of things wrong in this flesh, but yet the difference is we should have a desire to serve God, to leave those things behind. Yeah. So he says, after you become servants to God, he says, ye have fruit and holiness. Mm-hmm. We're serving God, good fruit will be the result. Mm-hmm. You know, Matthew 7 and 17, we looked at that last week a little bit. But a good tree will bring forth good fruit. But a crook tree will bring forth crook tree, fruit. <coughs> and specifically, holiness will be the result. That is, Purity is what holiness means, or to be consecrated or set apart to God. When we're serving Him, He will use us. Amen. When we're truly trying to bring forth fruit for Him, we will be used of Him. If we try to serve two masters, we can't be used of either one. You know, for the, the world will view us then truly as a hypocrite, won't they? Mm-hmm. I know sometimes they use that term to describe Christians because we mess up, but when we try to serve God and get hang out of the world, we truly are a hypocrite then. Right. The holiness isn't a very popular teaching today, but yet holiness is what we are called to do. Amen. Turn to two places, or at least one place here. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse number seven. And we all know the ending of this chapter talks about the, the rapture or the catching away when we shall be called to meet the dead in Christ in the air, and we shall be ever forever with the Lord. But notice what verse seven says: For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Mm-hmm. Well, we we are to leave spiritual and moral uncleanness behind us. We are to fall after holiness. We are to <clears throat> at least seek to be set apart for God, both really primarily in the way in which we live and conduct ourselves in this world. We are called in Titus chapter 2 to live godly, soberly, righteously in this present world. I see if among the more reformed type people that they they don't put much emphasis on living a godly life. You're right. And no, we don't do that to earn our salvation or keep our salvation or to earn brownie points with God or anything like that. But yet, because God has saved us, because he has freed us from sin, because he has given us a new life, we are to serve him. Amen. We are really to live a life wholly dedicated to him. Mm-hmm. Now, that doesn't mean we can't enjoy things in this life, but that should not be our chief goal. Really, it is to fear God and keep his commandments. That is the whole duty of man. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 tells us. Notice what he says here in the end of this verse, back in our text here. He have fruit and never unto holiness and the end of everlasting life. And Hebrews 12, 14 tells us that without holiness we can't see the Lord. Mm-hmm. But the end result of a life of sin is everlasting death, as we saw at the end of verse 21. But the end of a result of a life serving God is everlasting life. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean we earn this everlasting life by our service to God. But really, anyone who has truly been free from sin and this has become a servant of God, everlasting life will be theirs in the end. Mm-hmm. All those who are truly in Christ, I believe, will serve Him, even though not perfectly. And in the end, we will receive everlasting life. No, I don't. I fully believe, you know, once saved, always saved. Or 
Perseverance of the Saints or Preservation of the Saints. It has different names. <laughs> really, preservation and perseverance describe two different aspects of the right. same teaching. That we will continue on serving Him is the perseverance part. And the preservation part is that God will keep us. Mm -hmm. Amen. But we can't use that as an excuse to look. Well, I'm saved anyway. It doesn't really matter what I do. Right. Well, I'm saved, so it doesn't matter if I live a faithful life or I don't. That's what some people try to use that teaching as an excuse for. But you're right. No, someone who has truly been changed by God should live a changed life. Mm -hmm. But you can be sure whoever is truly serving God, they've truly been born again. Mm -hmm. And we see, like I said, I've mentioned those who come in and try to clean up their act and they usually laugh for a little while and they fall away. But ultimately, only you and God know your condition. But if you don't have a desire to serve God, I would check to see what you really have. Right. So a life that is truly dedicated to God is a result of him making us free from sin. So the life that is truly serving him is because he has, if I could say it this way, bought us off the auction block of sin. Yet in the end, we will receive eternal life. Amen. And then on the other hand, if you live a life of wickedness and sin and never come to Christ, if your end shall be eternal death. Mm -hmm. That we mentioned that we see, we'll see it at the great white throne, and those are cast alive in the lake of fire, which burn day and night forever and ever. The beast and the false prophet there, Satan are there. Yet so shall we all be those who don't have faith in Christ. Let's go on to verse 23. We'll try to bring this to a close here. I think we all know this verse, for the wages of sin is death. You know, death is the pay in which sin earns, isn't it? Death is the really the just reward for sin. Mm -hmm. You know, this wages here in Paul's day would refer to the, the pay and the rations given to a soldier for his service. Mm -hmm. The soldier served his country and he got certain pay and other provisions for his service. And if you serve sin, well, death will be what you get. Mm -hmm. It's much like uh, us that are employed today. You know, I go and work for my company in exchange I get wages so the brother Larry and others here brother Eric he goes and works on the, for the road department and they pay him for his service that's exactly what the wages of sin is right when you work for sin when you serve sin death is going to be what you get paid we I mentioned the different types of death Physical death is where we all see, all the time, we see death around us. But spiritual death is the worst death that comes from the wages of sin. To be eternally separate from God. We that are saved, we were once dead in our sins. Mm -hmm. Because our, our sin nature cut us off from God. Ezekiel 18 verse 4 says the soul that sinneth it shall die. Right. And again Ezekiel 18 20 says the same thing the soul that sinneth it shall die. So sin is not a light thing. Sin always brings about death. And really that is the reason Christ had to die. It was to pay for sin. Without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. Hebrews tells us. He even went all the way back to the very first sin in the garden and an innocent animal had to die to cover their sin. Amen. All throughout the law, it's offering sacrifices for sin. <laughs> whether it's you slay an animal and burn it on the altar, or whether you 
slay and offer it up in a different way. Yet, and everything <laughs> paid for sin and death has to occur. Mm -hmm. So for the unsaved, it will be death, physical death followed by eternal death. For us that are saved, though Christ has paid up and only for us. And we we're just saying Jesus paid it all. That includes this the ultimately ultimate end of sin, which is death. Mm -hmm. James 1 15, I think we all know that. Blessed when we have to see brings forth sin, sin when it's finished brings forth death. No sin doesn't necessarily immediately kill us. But when it's done with you, you can be sure death will be the end result. Amen. But that's how the serpent beguiled Eve in the garden. Surely, you shall not surely die, right? Well, they didn't, they did, I think, spiritually die that day, but physically they didn't just drop dead. Mm -hmm. well, Saying it was kind of like, me and I were talking about this recently, how boa constrictor, how it doesn't just go and swallow up its prey all at once, does it? <laughs> it watches it and then it wraps itself around and slowly crushes it to death and then eats it. That's exactly how sin does, though. Mm -hmm. Sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. You can be sure it brings suffering and pain during the whole process. Mm -hmm. well, the wages of sin is death. Mm -hmm. To this point, when the man wants to die, and after this, the judgment, we all know that verse, I think. And when we say that Christ has paid this penalty for us, it doesn't necessarily free us from physical death because this flesh has not been perfected yet. This flesh still goes on sinning until one day this mortal shall put on immortality, this corruptible shall put on incorruption. We shall be given that body that's like his glorious body. Mm -hmm. But that spiritual death has been taken care of by the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we'll see in the next part of our verse here, but the gift of God. Well, what God does is always so much better than what sin has caused, doesn't it? Sin has caused death, and yet the gift of God is eternal life of Jesus Christ our Lord. <laughs> you notice here it is a gift. It's not wages. It's not something we earn, but rather it's given completely of the grace of God. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what a gift is. It's something given freely on behalf of the giver. No one had to twist God's arm to give us this gift. No. He wasn't obligated to give us this gift. And we certainly do not earn it in any sort of way. Otherwise, it would no longer be a gift, would it? Right. We already know the end of the verse, but what is this gift he's referring to? Because there's several things called the gift of God in scriptures. Well, for example, Ecclesiastes tells us that for a man to partake of the fruit of his labor, that is the gift of God. So there goes your socialism and communism. He also tells us that the gift of God is can't be bought with money. Peter tells Simon that very clearly in the book of Acts. Right. In fact, he said, Thy money perish with you. Without the honestly, gift of God could be purchased. Well, the gift of God here is eternal life. Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, he says. And this eternal is the same as everlasting in verse 23. That everlasting life and eternal life, they are synonyms, if you will. Everlasting means lasting forever. Eternal means without end. You might say, well, that's the same thing, isn't it? <laughs> Not exactly. Well, that, our, that this life is everlasting means it shall continue and be sufficient for all of eternity. <laughs> that this life is eternal tells us that it will be without end. That it is, will continue on and on and on and on. Amen. I know eternal doesn't always register with our finite minds, does it? Mm -hmm. We are bound by time. Sometimes it's even hard to grasp that Methuselah lived as long as he did. Mm -hmm. We, being 
having about 80 years at best, usually, give or take. We know some have lived in their, their hundreds in recent times, and yet we know some die at very early ages. But 70 to 80 years is the average lifespan for us today, so eternity is a difficult concept to grasp. I think that's why the natural man doesn't like to recognize eternity. They think that this life is all there is to it. And yet, we can be sure eternity awaits every last one of us. Amen. But we must also realize that eternal life is given to us through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's without any merit of our own. Mm -hmm. That it's not through any of these other prophets or teachers, not through any of these other men who have lived. Joseph Smith did not get a new revelation from God. Amen. Gandhi had a lot of good ideas, but he did not have salvation. That's right. And Buddha and the Hindus as well, they can not give you eternal life. Muhammad, his view of eternal life was corrupt and well, ultimately because he was not a saved person to begin with. Amen. Well, only, only Christ can give eternal life. Well, I want us to consider before we bring this to a close, uh, what is eternal life or everlasting life? They find it interesting to only find that phrase used once in the Old Testament, in Daniel chapter 12. And there he's really referring to the, the rapture, I believe, or at least the resurrection at the end of times. He says that some will be raised unto life everlasting. Well, that is to say, we shall be raised incorruptible, immortal. We shall be forever with the Lord, First Thessalonians tells us. The rest, they will be raised to eternal destruction, eternal condemnation. <clears throat> the Old Testament doesn't give us a whole lot about eternal life, but yet I believe they knew at least in part about it because he right. also very clearly says, though my skin warms his body, though my skin warms my body destroyed, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Amen. Psalms talks about things that are lasting forever. In fact, Psalms 23, everyone loves to quote that, funeral especially. He says, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Mm -hmm. Yes, the Old Testament saints knew about eternal life. Maybe they didn't have any perfect understanding of it yet. In fact, that God had not expelled Adam and Eve from the garden, and it's Scripture very clearly says they could have partaken of the tree of life and lived forever. No, we have, a, we have quite a few references in the New Testament about eternal life, everlasting life, or sometimes life eternal, life everlasting. We'll turn to a few of those. John chapter 3 being the most famous one. Okay. Now, this is the earliest that the Gospels mention it chronologically. Christ speaking here in John chapter 3 and Nicodemus, verses 15 through 16. It says that whosoever believeth in him, let's go to verse 14 as well. It says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have ever life, or have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. So to believe on Christ is to have eternal life. That is the way to possess that eternal life, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Amen. You no know, one came to him and said, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Christ, of course, knowing his heart, knew that he didn't. The desire to know Christ, but he says, well, keep the commandments. It's all these I've kept from my youth up. Well, one thing I lack is go and sell all of that possess and give the poor, follow me. Right. 
He probably knew his heart that he he just wanted to know what he could do to earn eternal life. And yet we saw very plainly there in our text that he could not earn that eternal life. It is a gift completely of God. Mm -hmm. But to possess it, we must have faith in Christ. And only then will he give us eternal life. As we can talk about faith is also the gift of God, according to Ephesians chapter 2. And we cannot have, we cannot believe on him until he gives us faith. This really goes all the way back to the, the thought that salvation is of the Lord, that without him we could not be saved, without him we cannot even begin to save ourselves. Go over to John chapter 17 for a moment. <clears throat> John chapter 17, verse 3. Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and read verse 1, 2, 3, 4. It says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. See, it is Christ that gives eternal life, not man that earns it. Amen. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So to know God and to know Christ, that is eternal life, he says. And John expounds upon that in 1 John chapter 5. Turn there and read a few verses for us and hopefully make sense of this for y'all. 1 John chapter 5, beginning in verse 10. The book of 1 John talks a lot about eternal life. And I think verse 10 through 12 gives us a good summary of that, verse 20 as well. 1 John 5 10 says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God gave have given to us eternal life, and this is life, and this life is in his Son. Amen. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. That was verse 20 as well. He says, And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given to us understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Amen. So to be in Christ and earning in Him through faith in Him, that is eternal life, he says. Without getting off on a rabbit trail, we know that faith is a gift of God. We know that all men have not faith, the scriptures tell us. We also know that it is God which must keep us safe, not we ourselves. So to be in Christ and remain in Him, that is eternal life. Mm -hmm. John in another place tells us, or Christ, who in the Gospel of John says that we are in his hand, and no man can pluck us out. And when we're in the Father's hand, no man can pluck us out of his hand either. So salvation begins and ends with God, doesn't it? Amen. From the first act to the end of it, from the first convicting of your of your heart all the way to the completion of it when we shall be caught up to meet him in the air. It's all the work of God. I think John chapter 6 verse 47 makes what eternal life is very plain and clear. I'm going to turn and read it for us. John 6 verse 47. that I made the right decision or that I 
I was baptized, or I prayed this prayer, or I did this or that. No, we'll just have faith in Christ and what He has done, and you shall have eternal life. Amen. <laughs> but if not, you shall have eternal damnation, eternal death in the lake of fire. Those are the end result of all men. Either returning in the presence of God or returning away from Him in the lake of fire. For the wages of sin is death, but thanks be to God that the gift of God is eternal life for Jesus Christ our Lord. We'll bring that to a close. We'll, we'll start chapter 7 next time. He begins, to, he really is on the same thoughts. So he gives us a picture of how we are dead to the law and alive to Christ. Amen. Until next time.